Hello, Health 230 students. This is lecture three of three for chapter number 14. I'm going to apologize now for speaking rather quickly because I have quite a few slides to get through in a very short period of time. We're going to start out talking about high-risk pregnancies. And there are behaviors that are incompatible with pregnancy. Uh, those include imp improper nutrition, uh, and as you can well imagine, well imagine that is very common. Uh, alcohol, illicit drug use, cigarette smoking, and for that matter, using any uh, type of tobacco product. And the last one that you see there, diabetes, is a progressively larger and larger issue in our society due to the fact that simple sugars are so readily available and the fact that we as Americans are not very physically active. Some acronyms you need to know, LBW, AGA, and SGA. LBW stands for low birth weight. Any child being born at less than 5 pounds 8 ounces is considered to be low birth weight. AGA stands for appropriate for gestational age. Sometimes we see women giving birth early. Uh, a baby being premature is not necessarily always um, always a situation that is going to cause consequences for the baby. If the baby is an appropriate size for its gesta gestational age and is not significantly premature, these babies catch up fairly well and oftentimes they don't have any developmental issues. But what, what is much more common is that when babies are premature that they are small for their gestational age and these babies do suffer some consequences and oftentimes do not catch, do not catch up well. As a clinician, you need to know about the WIC program. Uh, there are um, there are many WIC programs throughout the United States. They are state programs here in Virginia. The div the division, I'm sorry, the Department of Health is the um, is the organization <clears throat> that administers the program. And uh, it is a program specifically to provide appropriate nutrition and education to women as well as, as children who otherwise would not have those resources available to them. So um, it's worth having that phone number and um, uh, yeah, that, that, that email address, in particular the phone number. What you need to do, in my opinion, if, um, if you suspect that a, a woman does not have an adequate amount of food and uh, just in general does not have the, um, the information that she needs to raise a child appropriately or to take care of herself while she is pregnant, you need to make sure that she calls that phone number. Uh, let's move on to diabetes, and di diabetes is a huge issue here in America. It, it is growing at near epidemic levels, and um, I'm gonna I'm not gonna talk about pre-existing diabetes because that's a that, that's kind of a it's uh, kind of a different um, different monster, but. Uh, we will talk about gestational diabetes because it's not unusual to see women suffering from diabetes um, you know, about midway through their pregnancy and, and during that latter half of their pregnancy. Uh, luckily, there's a very routine screening that tells us uh, whether or not a woman is suffering from gestational diabetes. And we, we oftentimes see gestational diabetes in women who are are sedentary or are eating a lot of simple sugars. Uh, yeah, another another way of saying that is, if if a woman is drinking a lot of soda or she's eating a lot of candy bars or a lot of desserts, or a lot of ice cream, that type of thing, she is putting herself at significant risk for gestational diabetes. Uh, yes, a woman does need additional calories during pregnancy, but um, yeah, at at the most, she needs about 450 calories. Additionally, uh, at the end of the pregnancy, and yeah, that, that's nothing more than about a that that's that's a a large candy bar. <laughs> um, and and I, I think we all know that some people do have a tendency to to overindulge. And um, when a woman is overindulging during pregnancy, that can cause her blood glucose levels to elevate very significantly. That is going to cause the fetus to grow faster than it should. That's ultimately going to result in a, a very large baby. 
and um, there's there's complications when when you have a nine, ten, eleven pound baby uh, giving birth to a baby that large vaginally can put both the mother as well as the the baby at risk. <clears throat> Oh, it's also important to note that um, that gestational diabetes does increase blood pressure, uh, or it can increase blood pressure, and that puts a woman at risk for preeclampsia as well as eclampsia. Now, moving on to information about hypertension. Uh, sometimes women do develop hypertension during their pregnancy. It's usually mild and, and returns to normal after birth. However, if that blood pressure is elevated significantly enough, that will put the woman at risk for a heart attack as well as stroke. And the other big risk is that when a woman has high blood pressure, there is a risk of the placenta uh, separating from the uterine wall early, and that will, of course, result in a stillbirth. I think it's important to point out that percentage that you see there underneath the first bullet point that preeclampsia affects 5 to 8 percent of all pregnancies. So that's pregnancies, that's a big number. Uh, that's, um, that's saying that somewhere between 1 in 10 and, and just about 1 in 20 um, that they, that, that that many people suffer from uh, suffer from preeclampsia or that many women, pregnant women suffer from preeclampsia. And considering that most of you all are planning on being clinicians, it's safe to say that you're going to be dealing with pregnant women at some point in time during your career. And uh, you need to know that um, that there is a very, di there very distinct possibility that a person that you may be treating may have preeclampsia. Uh, and if that's the case, then there are some things that she needs to be doing immediately to um, to to. to to deal with that condition. Um, another, something else that causes high risk pregnancies is simply having a baby at a young age. Um, adolescents oftentimes just don't have enough information to take good care of their bodies during pregnancies and that results in, in premature preterm births, stillbirths. Uh, it's not unusual at all for adolescents to give birth to low birth weight infants. There's also a risk on the other end. Um, older women, the genetic quality of their eggs degrades and that dramatically increases the risk of Down syndrome. Some of the, the major uh, practices that are incompatible with pregnancy, smoking, using any type of, of tobacco product that's going to retard fetal growth. Uh, if, if the baby is lucky enough to make it, it's certainly going to be of low birth weight. Um, it can cause complications at birth that you see, see listed over on the right hand side there. Uh, foodborne il illness is a major concern. Uh, when, when we, if most of us will at some point get a foodborne illness, um, the two most common Salmonella E. coli, uh, with Salmonella being, um, I would say, easily the most common, those types of conditions can cause fairly significant gastrointestinal distress, which can dehydrate a person very quickly. Um, pregnant women cannot become dehydrated. When they become dehydrated, there are immediate consequences to the fetus. So um, it's very important that women make sure that their that pregnant women make sure that their food is cooked appropriately. Um, also, it's important to note that um, you never want a megadose on any vitamin, much less the fat-soluble vitamins, um, with vitamin A being uh, being one that can be very quickly toxic to the to the fetus. Um, also, drinking signif significant amounts of caffeine during pregnancy risky. Uh, the, the, there, there was a study that I read uh, maybe a year, year and a half, two years ago, uh, that showed that there's a correlation between caffeine intake and ADHD later in the child's life, or, or caffeine intake during pregnancy and ADHD uh, later in the child's life. All right, let's move on to lactation, and. Um, Breastfeeding 
is important. Uh, we know that there are better outcomes for babies uh, if they are breastfed versus bottle fed, and um, uh, some some of the, the benefits include that they're going to provide hormones that provide physiological development. Uh, that there, some studies have shown that there's an improvement in cognitive de cognitive development. Uh, the uh, the next one is is one of the the most important in my opinion, and that is that by breastfeeding, a mother is going to help protect her baby from uh, infections because antibodies do cross the placenta. Um, that, that makes no sense. Um, they, they, of course, cross the placenta, but that's not <laughs> what we're talking about. Um, uh, what I meant to say was that antibodies um, make their way into the breast milk, which provides some level of immunity for the, uh, for the, the baby. Uh, Two hormones that you need to know, prolactin and oxycontin. Prolactin is the hormone responsible for milk production. And oxytocin is the hormone responsible for the letdown reflex or that allows for the milk to be released from the breasts. And something on a, on a side note, um, something that is really interesting about oxytocin is that the hormone also has an effect on the brain. And... Um, I've, I've, I've heard it referred to as the, the love hormone. And oxytocin, it, it helps um, a mother form a bond with her child. So by breastfeeding, um, there's a, a higher probability that the mother is going to form a bond with that child. Um, whoops. Yeah, we'll skip over. We'll skip over that. <clears throat> and in the interest of time, we're going to skip over. I'll, I'll ask that you look at that slide yourself. Uh, it's very important that a new mother get an appropriate amount of vitamins and minerals, and oftentimes that's going to um, going to mean that she's going to need to take a multivitamin. Uh, it's very important that a mother drink appropriate amounts of water to keep hydrated because if a woman is dehydrated, uh, milk production d just it just doesn't occur, and um, in inadequate amounts of of water they don't really affect the the quality of the milk, but um, they most definitely affect the quantity. So without adequate amounts of, of water ingestion, uh, there's no way for, for milk or lactation to occur, for, for milk production to occur or lactation to occur. Uh, it's important to note that women who are HIV positive, that they should not breastfeed their babies. It is, it is absolutely possible, and um, it's not, it's even... Um, very commonplace now for a baby to be born to an HIV positive mother and for the baby to be HIV negative. Uh, the doctors have gotten really good at, uh, at being able to do that. But um, even if the fetus, even if the baby is HIV negative at birth, it can still contract HIV by breastfeeding after birth. All right, last, um, last item that we'll talk about for the next minute or so is fetal alcohol syndrome. Um, fetal alcohol syndrome occurs because a woman drinks during those critical periods of pregnancy. Uh, and um, it is, it's a very safe rule of thumb to say that there's no safe level of alcohol uh, for a pregnant mother to drink. Um, in the in interest of time, I'm going to let you look over the symptoms of, uh, of fetal alcohol syndrome. And um, please, please, please make sure that you are communicating that information to the people that you work with because um, uh, alcohol can very easily cause fetal alcohol syndrome, especially when the woman drinks early in pregnancy. Thank you for your attention. and. Um, and good luck in preparing for the test on chapter number 14.